Hello Internet, Mike Bertolini here, back playing yet another episode of Cthulhu Chronicles. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't entirely remember where I was. So, I may play the doing of a section that I already did, or I might be skipping over a section. It's been a while since I've played anything, any of these, so... To begin. Um, I'm going with the good professor. Because I kind of think that I played Pepper Trace already. Let's see. Who am I going to play this time? I'm going to just do Dr. Loretta, golly. The afternoon sun has cast the street outside in orange gold. The long shadows cut pinstripes into the fabric of the city. But you have more important things to do than appreciate the view. You turn your heel and stride off towards Green Grove Road. The streets at this time of day are full of slow moving idlers, people talking and laughing with friends and family, and generally enjoying themselves. None of that has anything to do with you. Keep your gaze fixed on the path forward and try not to think about it. Green Grove is just as Alice described it. Elegant. Pristine townhouses line either side of the street. There's no one milling about on this road. It's all but deserted, actually. You count the house numbers carefully, following them until you reach 112... 1211. It looks just like all the other houses on the street. By now you know better than to be fooled by appearances. Okay. Um I pick the lock. Luckily you came prepared. You pulled the necessary tool from your pocket and set to work. Crouching in front of a door to pick its lock is a rather compromising position, so you have to work fast and effectively. There, the tumbler. Two, and three, and four. So finally. The door glides open smoothly. Whoever oiled these hinges did a good job. Inside of the house is lit only by the dim light filtering through the windows. You can just barely make out the shapes of walls and furniture. You step forward through the entryway, leaving the door open behind you. The last thing you want to do is block your only exit. Your footsteps land silently on the floorboards as you walk into the house's foyer. The wall on your left opens up to reveal a sitting room. And there are two closed doors in the wall to your right, before it extends forward through an open archway. Now, into the sitting room. The sitting room is immaculate. A plush pink couch sits against the nearest wall, with a piano and elegant end tables as its neighbors. In the middle of the room, a tastefully low coffee table is covered in framed photos, all turned face down. The vase in the center of the table is full of long, wilted flowers. Halfway across the room, the layout shifts to accommodate a dining room table with eight chairs. There are more dead flowers in the center of the dining table. The 
two doors in the right wall are right next to each other, both closed. Neither gives you any hint as to what lies on the other side. Well, open the first door. You cautiously open the first door to your right. It takes your eyes a moment to adjust, but when they do, all you can see is a complete mess. There are lingering signs in this room's former purpose. A bookcase lined in one wall and a desk sits adjacent to it. Once upon a time, this was a study. The mess, however, makes this room more of a disaster area than anything. The desks, mesh, and chairs lie halfway across the room on its side. The books from the bookcase have been scattered across the floor. The desk and floor are both littered with paper, all of which has been written on in spidery black script. You step further into the room and scrutinize the mess. There may be some order to it, if you can just look hard enough to find it. You start with the books, but they're all standard tomes one might find in a home library. Encyclopedias, modern treatises on the nature of man, that sort of thing. The sort of books one collects when one wants to look smart, but has no intention of actually reading. The papers are another matter. You lean down to peer at the writings on the desk, hoping to glean some meaning from them. The script is difficult to read, and after a few frustrating minutes, you are forced to admit you have no idea what they mean. You may as well be mad scribblings, for all that you can decipher them. And who knows? Maybe they are. You certainly have no way of knowing. Time to open the second door. The second door on your right swings open into a bathroom. It is dark, but from what you can see, it's clean and empty. It's also small. It's barely a half bath and not very wide at all. Most of the space is taken up by the typical bathroom fixtures. There's a small bar of soap next to the sink and a nearly used up roll of toilet paper next to the, well, toilet. Other than that, there's not much to look at. So time to head down the hall. The hallway here is just as dark and quiet. There's a kitchen to your right and a staircase leading up to the second floor. There's an open door to your left leading into a dining room. The house's back door is set into the far wall. The second closed door sits perpendicular to it and the wall is under the stairs. Well, enter the dining room. The dining room is made of polished dark wood and eight matching chairs sit around it. A vase of long dead flowers decorates the center of the table. The room extends through an open doorway with a layout shift to accommodate a sitting room complete with a pink couch and piano. There are more dead flowers in the center of the waiting sitting room's long coffee table. The kitchen is pristine, utterly devoid of any signs of life. Countertops are empty, except for a single bowl of fruit in the corner. Upon closer inspection, it appears the apples inside are mostly rotten. You open the refrigerator door and immediately slam it shut again. The smell from within is heinous. It lingers long after you shut the door again. You figure the kitchen as quickly as possible. Okay, so what should I do? Well, cautiously. I'm not going to the back door. I broke in. I'm not leaving. I'm not just yet. The upper level of the house is wider than the lower, owing to the open doors of all the rooms and drawn curtains within said rooms. The rooms appear to all be bedrooms, except for one bathroom. There are three bedrooms, one of which is the master bedroom. The first two bedrooms are cozy and well kept, clearly unused. The master bedroom is big enough to have room for two armchairs, a fireplace, and its own master bedroom as well. It's also in complete disarray. The walls constant in this bedroom are still lit, 
and they illuminate a fraught scene. Frame photos lie sight, face down on the room's dresser and bedside tables. The room's one wall mounted photographs lie shattered on the floor, surrounded by pieces of broken glass. The bed is unmade, as if recently slept in. The blankets are twisted up and dangle halfway off the mattress. Whoever slept here did so fitfully. We found no way out. You open the back door and strike through it. As you cross the threshold, a queer feeling spreads across your skin. A feeling quickly shifts as searing pain, and the very air around you seems to compress inwards, pushing you back into the house. You're left lying on the floor of the hallway, sweating profusely and grasping for air. Well, it's clear now that it is definitely a trap on which there's apparently no escaping from. You have no choice but to see it through to the end. Hmm. Back to the dining room. Nope. The kitchen. into the basement. You open the door and freeze in place. Stairs descend from the open doorway leading down into the home's basement. You can't see or hear anything from here, but the air wafting up from below is ripe with decay. Not a particular good sign. You descend slowly, carefully, into the basement. You're hyper aware of each too loud footstep, every stumble in the dark. When you finally get far enough down to see the basement's contents, you immediately want to turn back around. A circle of flickering candles surrounds a complicated circular diagram on the floor. Two bodies lie at the circle center, each wrapped in red cloth. The symbols within the diagram are blurred faintly, and the air above them ripples as if warped by heat. You look up past the circle of candles and the two bodies, and there's Lighter. The fake Lighter, anyway. She's just far enough away from the candles that you didn't notice her right away. The rippling heat, heated air also made her look slightly unreal, like a mirage in the desert. Thank you for coming, she says. I was worried you'd figure out this was a trap and not show up. But here you are, just as naive and predictable as before. Fraud stares, expecting at you. By all means, make an impassioned speech. I'd expect nothing less. The imposter smiles. I'm certainly not leader, but you already knew that. She steps forward and the candlelight shine more clearly on her face. You can see what Alice meant now. This woman is sharper and brighter than the one you remember. Like a snake that's just had its sh shed its skin. Of course, the imposter says. So she gives you a patronizing look. Were you hoping my admission would bring some sort of clarity? That if I admitted it, I'd feel so guilty I'd just turn myself in? Were you still unsure about who could have possibly murdered the professor? She scoffs. I sincerely hope it was the former, and you're much less intelligent than I gave you credit for. I've been planning this for years, she says. But it wasn't until a few months ago that everything finally started to fall into place. You were the last puzzle piece I needed to make everything fit. She smiles and starts pacing back and forth on the other side of the circle. I needed someone to help me reclaim the Necronomicon. And there you were. I needed someone to take the fall for leader's death. And there you were again. You can solve my two biggest problems in one fell swoop. And you did. Oh, 
honestly, I never could have predicted you do this. Even if you did get a little too noisy when all was said and done, she says. You, coming to Auckland and helping a retired professor? The dean hiring you as a last desperate measure? And all of this is just when I thought the Necronomicon might slip through my fingers. She smiles. That was the closest I've ever come to believing in fate. Unfortunately, she says, you had to go and make everything messy. You and that damned inspector. I was counting on an instant conviction. When you were released instead, things became complicated. She starts pacing faster, gesturing with both hands as she gets more worked up. Suddenly, I had multiple parties sniffing around where they shouldn't be. You would have been enough trouble on your own, but the police? And effective as they generally are, there was still a chance they might stumble onto something incriminating. That's a risk I couldn't afford to take. Ultimately, I realized I had no choice but to kill you. I didn't necessarily divert the police's attention, but it will keep you from leading them to me. Or well, from taking action against me yourself, which you seem fairly intent upon. She spreads her arms wide. So, welcome to the end. A small ring of noise draws your attention to the pocket of her apron. The imposter reaches inside and pulls out an egg timer. She turns it off and looks back at you with a smile. Thank you for listening, she says. It was very kind of you to let me buy so much time. She puts the egg timer back in her pocket and brings out a small knife. Without breaking eye contact, eye contact, she speaks two words in a language you've heard once before and still cannot understand. A gust of wind blasts out from the circle, catching you off guard and making you stumble back. Your head knocks painfully against the staircase, disorienting you. Next thing you feel is a sharp pain in your side. When you open your eyes, the fake leader is standing just in front of you, backlit by the light of the ritual circle. The pain in your side intensifies. You look down and see the imposter's little knife sticking out of your side. Thanks again, she says, and gives the knife a violent twist. She wrenches the knife free and ducks away before you can retaliate, disappearing up the stairs and clatter of footsteps. The basement door slams shut behind her. Blood flows steadily from the open wound. You stare down at the rapidly pooling blood at your feet, watching as it trickles forward to make contact with the ritual circle. The circle flashes and lights up bright green. The bodies at its center disintegrate, and the fragmented bits of flesh and cloth and bone flow upwards to congeal in midair. The longer you watch, the more horrifying the sight becomes. The thing taking shape in the air above the ritual circle is as disgusting and natural as anything you've seen. It has a hulking, vaguely humanoid shape, like Gardner after his transformation. But it lacks a face. As you watch the blank place where its face should be splits open, a long, slimy tongue falls out of a gaping mouth. Teeth slide out along its edges. You tear your eyes away from the abomination and scramble up the stairs. A screeching roar from within the circle adds extra urgency to your steps. You grit your teeth against the pain and manage to make it to the basement door. You hear the thing behind you quickly approaching, though. You only have a few seconds advantage. You yank the door open and sprint through, slamming it shut again behind you. Hopefully, monsters don't know how to use doorknobs. The only sound in the house is the creatures angry banging at the basement door. You can hear the woods starting to splinter. You examine your options. The only rooms with doors on this first floor, the bathroom, and the study. There's no time to get up to the second floor. Hide in the study. Duck into the study just as the hinges, just as the basement door slams open, thrown off its hinges. Everything is silent for a few seconds. Then muffled footsteps start creeping down the hall towards your hiding place. You won't be able to stay here forever, but maybe, if your time is just right, you can let the monster in here and buy yourself more time to figure out a plan. You 
wait patiently for the creature to approach, trying to gauge the perfect moment to rip the door open and swap places with the monster. You hear a stop in front of the door, rip its hind legs, and you pull open the door just as the monster bounces forward. It goes sailing through the now empty doorway and hits the far wall with a loud thump. You waste no time in scurrying outside and shutting the door behind you. You even pull one of the chairs from the dining room to wedge up under the doorknob. The monster's already started banging at the door. You don't have much time before it breaks free. You try for the front door, and upstairs and barricade yourself in the bedroom. You run for the front door, and it closes around the doorknob and instantly flares with a burning pain. You put your hand away, there are runes glowing on the doorknob and matching blisters bubbling up in the palm of your hand. Wow, dead and insane. The strain is too much. The fragile human part of your mind breaks and gives way to insanity. Well, thank you for watching. Remember to smash that like and subscribe button and leave a comment below if you want to see more of this. Um, let me know if you would like me to do a playthrough of all the chapters, all in one video. Um, also let me know if you like me narrating it or if you want to just read it at your own pace, pausing to read everything. So thank you for watching and have a great day.